Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to part one of episode 10. In episode 10, I will be looking at this hammer. And in part one specifically, I will answer the question as to whether blood was found in this hammer or not. So after Fred's fingerprints were found in volume one, the police conducted a search of his vehicle, his apartment, as well as his office. Before they conducted the search of his vehicle, uh, they asked Fred whether there was anything valuable inside the vehicle. And he said yes, and he went in and he pulled out this ornamental hammer. Instead of a claw on one side, it has a beer bottle opener. The hammer is about 26 centimeters long, weighs about 330 grams, about the same as a can of Coke. And part of the handle was covered uh, with a black rubber grip and it had Fred 2004 engraved on the metal shelf. The police told Fred uh, to put the hammer back to where he found it so that they could take photos. And here's a photo of uh, the hammer behind the seat. Sometime later, uh, Director Trollope showed a photo of this hammer to uh, Mrs. Lotz, Inga's mother, and she told him that this was a gift from her and Inga to Fred, that she bought this hammer at the gift store in 2002 already, and she just kept it for uh, waiting for the right opportunity to, to give it to someone. So this gift was given to Fred in Christmas 2004. So soon after the murder, Fred apparently told the private investigator that he had a hammer in his vehicle, uh, which he has never used. He also said that later, he went to his vehicle to see if the hammer was still there, and it was. Although this hammer had sentimental value to Fred, he just left it behind the seat of his uh, vehicle until the police discovered it there, or until he removed it in the presence of the police on April the 15th, 2005. Now, the fact that Fred kept the hammer and did not dispose of it is often used by people as further proof of his innocence. Now, if we presume for a moment that the hammer is the murder weapon, the fact that he kept it just shows how calculating and clever Fred was. Now, Fred probably figured that the police would find out that the hammer was used in a murder. In fact, that is what the coroner, uh, Dr. Ansi Ardendorf, told the police right there. You need to look for a hammer because uh, some of these wounds were made by hammer and what if the police then ask fred and other suspects and friends of inga whether they have hammers and whether they would be willing to submit their hammers for forensic testing if fred then claimed that he didn't have a hammer and the police then found out later from mrs lotz or from marius or from somebody else that he had the hammer it would have been very suspicious. Uh, and it would have been better for him to just simply admit that he had the hammer than claiming that he lost the hammer or that he gave it away. So on April the 18th, uh, Sergeant Peter Davids received the hammer from Superintendent Cock for forensic testing. According to her affidavit, he conducted a test in the hammer using luminol to test for a possible presence of blood. Now, luminol is a chemical used by forensic investigators to detect small trace amounts of blood left at crime scenes, as it reacts with the iron found in hemoglobin. It's extremely sensitive and can detect blood in a dilution of one per five million. It's a test that needs to be conducted in the dark because it produces a, a glow, a luminance, hence the name luminol. Now, luminol is considered a presumptive test, as there are substances, other substances that can react with luminol, such as, for example, bleeds and different kinds of paint. Laboratory staff, however, are trained and learn through experience to identify when the luminol reacts with blood. They do this type of luminol test probably on a daily basis. So they have a lot of experience knowing when the luminol reacts with blood. 
luminol reacts differently with different substances in terms of its duration, its intensity, and its color. And very importantly with blood, luminol is the only substance that can react with blood again when it's applied a second time. Therefore, luminol's reaction of blood is distinctive, unique, and recognizable, and therefore in the hands of a trained, experienced forensic analyst, a very reliable indicator of blood. And according to Sergeant Peter Davids, the luminol reacted positively in the indentations of the rubber part of the hammer's handle with the size and the distribution of the stain corresponding to a palm print. As Sergeant Davids have expressed to Thomas and myself her strong conviction that it was indeed blood. The type of reaction and the repeatability of the reaction is what one would expect from blood. Unfortunately, protocol did not permit Sergeant Davids to express this degree of certainty in the Section 212 affidavit, nor in her court testimony. And this is what the judge said in court. Sergeant Peter Davids tested the ornamental hammer for the presence of blood with luminol, a chemical reagent, and found that there could be possible blood, not ordinarily visible, present. She presumed that it was blood, but emphasized that the test was merely part of the screening process. In the present case, she would exclude most of the other substances that would react positively with luminol in favor of a presumption that there was blood on the hammer. Now, Sergeant Davids then took the luminol extraction, the, the liquid that she uh, retrieved from the hammer, and gave it to Superintendent Charlene Otto, uh, who was the chief forensic analyst to conduct a DNA test to determine if the substance suspected to be blood was from Inge. Superintendent Otto only found a small trace amount of DNA that originated from a male and one segment of a chromosome was tested indicated that the DNA likely belonged to Fred. Otto did however make it clear that the DNA was not necessarily from blood and that it could have been from skin cells that got transferred there through body, body fluids or sweat or just touching the hammer. Then later the judge concluded, the conclusion is supported by the fact that no blood could be found in the hammer and that it showed only traces of male genetic material. This, ladies and gentlemen, in my opinion, is a serious error of law and is entirely not consistent with the facts and evidence presented by Davids and Otten. Now the luminol reacted with something in a manner that's entirely consistent with blood. And because Inge's DNA was not found on the hammer, the judge completely dismissed Sergeant Davids's informed opinion and concluded that there was no blood in the hammer. Sergeant Davids was certain it was blood. So they, did, they even skipped a test, a definitive test for blood and went directly to a DNA test, not to prove that it was blood, but to determine if the blood could possibly have been Inga's blood. I need to emphasize, a DNA test is not a test for blood, as blood is not the only source of DNA. By the judge's argument, since Fred's DNA was on a hammer, he must therefore have blood on a hammer. And we know he never claimed nor admitted having blood in a hammer. Epithelial cells from skin is another source of DNA and gets deposited in an object whenever you touch it. And that's how Fred's DNA got in the hammer. He touched the hammer when he took it out from behind the seat to show the police. Now much is made of the fact that the Inge's DNA was not found. But ladies and gentlemen, even if Inge's DNA was found, it would still not have helped the state's case. All that the defense had to do was to argue that Inga's DNA got there because he touched the hammer. And it would have been a very simple thing for Fred to make some affidavit or a sworn statement saying that Inga touched the hammer in the weeks leading up to the murder. And nobody would have been able to prove Fred wrong. Let's assume for a moment it was Inga's blood in the hammer. 
The question is, why wasn't Inga's DNA found on the hammer? In the, the absence of DNA can in no way be taken as, conclu as conclusive proof that the blood wasn't hers. Firstly, let me explain. If the hammer was the murder weapon, it was cleaned very well. No luminal reaction was observed on the metal parts of the hammer. And considering the sensitivity of the luminal, this indicates that it was cleaned very well. That can be expected from someone who decided to keep the weapon instead of disposing of it. Now there are two types of blood cells, red cells and white cells. Now luminal reacts with the hemoglobin that's found only in red blood cells. DNA, on the other hand, is only found in white blood cells. Red blood cells don't contain DNA. So that which the luminal reacts with does not contain DNA. And that's very important to understand. Now the ratio of white blood cells to red blood cells is 1 in 500. In other words, for every one white blood cell, there are 500 red blood cells. Now luminol is extremely sensitive to blood. As I mentioned before, it can react to blood in dilutions of 1 in 5 million. In other words, luminol can detect a drop of blood diluted in 5 million drops of water. So when cleaning the hammer, the blood was diluted and most of the blood cells were washed away. But in the indentations of the rubber handle, a sufficient number of red blood cells remained behind to react with luminol. However, that does not mean that there were a sufficient number of white blood cells present to develop a usable DNA profile. One need up to 40 white blood cells to develop a usable profile. And on an object that had been washed thoroughly, it can simply be difficult to impossible to find a sufficient number of white blood cells. Now, admittedly, there's no definite proof that Inga's blood was in a hammer. Although it would have been good to have this proof, but given the nature of circumstantial evidence, it's not a deal breaker. Since we still have the strong likelihood that there was blood in the hammer. And I explained how laboratory staff are trained to recognize when luminol reacts with blood. Now, yes, we may argue that we don't know that for 100% sure either, and that's still okay. Because when it comes to circumstantial evidence, we don't need 100% certainty. A piece of circumstantial evidence does not need to be proven beyond reasonable doubt. It's a judge's responsibility to assess the probabilities and to weigh it together with all the other circumstantial evidence to see the total picture that emerges. The Supreme Court of Appeal in State versus Adebe in 1998 provided a very eloquent description of how circumstantial evidence should be treated. The court must guard against a tendency to focus too intently upon the separate and individual parts of what is, after all, a mosaic of proof. Doubts about one aspect of the evidence led in a trial may arise when that aspect is viewed in isolation. The doubts may be set at rest when it is evaluated again together with other available evidence. It is necessary to step back a pace and consider the mosaic as a whole. If that is not done, one may fail to see the wood for the trees. Also in the Oscar Pistorius trial, in the state head of argument, it is stated, in this trial, each separate piece of circumstantial evidence viewed in isolation may be argued to weigh only as much as a feather, but all the feathers together in the scale will convincingly balance the scale in favor of the state. Now with regards to the hammer, Luminol has indicated an extremely high likelihood of blood. Certainly not 100%, but a very high probability. Definitely not zero, as the judge claimed. What the judge should have said was, the conclusion is there is a high likelihood of blood in the hammer. However, no evidence could be 
found that the blood and the hammer belonged to Inger. However, this does not exclude the possibility that the blood could have been Inger's. It's inconclusive. That would have been a far more accurate statement. So as far as circumstantial evidence goes, what do we have so far? A hammer of unexplained possible blood was found in the vehicle of someone who argued with the victim on the day of the murder, whose fingerprint places him at the scene of the crime, but also lied about his movements to the police and his mother, leading up to the discovery of the body. So that is part one, ladies and gentlemen. In part two, I will look at as to whether the hammer could have made the wounds on Inga's head. Until then, take care. Thank you.